Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone. And welcome to IKG's Wisdom Wednesday on this March 15th, 2023. We are so happy and pleased that you are able to join us this evening. I am your gracious host, Sister Ajwa, and uh, we will at the first to start off by uh, finding out who all is in the room. And as you all are continuing to come into the room, just want to let you know that all cameras and microphones are automatically muted. And we ask that you engage us via the chat. And we will have a Q&A opportunity at the end of the presentation. And we ask that any questions that you will have for our presenter that you place them in the Q&A box. And as we're getting started, I want to thank everyone checking in from Danbury, Connecticut. Connecticut is my home state, so welcome, Connecticut. We have Chicago, North Carolina, of course, D.C., Virginia, New York, Maryland, Oregon, Bowie, Brooklyn, New York, uh, Michigan, Vancouver. So Canada is in the house. Welcome. Uh, California, Georgia. Maryland, Georgia, again, Las Vegas. We got Pennsylvania in the house. Welcome. Charlotte is in here again. Welcome, everybody. As we, we love to just do those quick shout outs to just recognize everyone and where they're checking in from and taking advantage of this virtual opportunity to be a family and expand our family across the globe. So before we get started, I just want to let you all know a couple of events that will be taking place with IKG. For those of you who may be new, IKG Wisdom Wednesday is a free monthly lecture series held the third Wednesday of the month. But there's a lot more that we do aside from the Wisdom Wednesdays. So this year is actually the 37th year of the Egypt on the Potomac field trips and our 2023 season begins on May 6th. We will return to the Thurgood Marshall Center in Washington, DC, and do the original bus field trip on the first Saturday of the month through November. Tickets for the 2023 season will be available on the IKG website starting March 25th. So if you haven't been on an Egypt on the Potomac field trip, or if you have been, we um, definitely encourage you to come out, come out again, bring your family, bring friends, tell people, sign up. Our field trips always sell out. So we do encourage you to purchase your tickets early to make sure that you have a seat. And again, those tickets will go on sale on March 25th. Speaking of selling out, our summer study tour of Egypt is already sold out and there will be seats available for the December study tour and details for that will be made available on the IKG website and that link will be placed in the chat for your convenience. Finally, our founder director, Tony Router, will be hosting two historic webinars in April and in May. The information uh, for April is why Nile Valley Civilization Matters. That webinar will take place on April 14th and the 21st. And then the second series will be Rebirth of African Consciousness, which will take place on May 19th and May 26th. The webinar to register for those special historic presentations um, has been placed in the chat and we will place it in the chat throughout the evening. So we definitely welcome you to take part in the additional programming that IKG puts together. You will not, you will definitely enjoy the information that is provided. So for tonight's program, we are so pleased to have a member of the IKG was a family present tonight, Dr. Kweli Zukiri. He'll be presenting what happens when Black youth engage with their African heritage. He writes, experiencing African-centered education and or socialization 
are an essential element of the development of a positive racial cultural identity for youth of African descent. However, as a result of growing up within a hegemonic post-slavery society that has not reconciled its brutal past and present, Black youth must navigate an onslaught of misinformation that leads them to dissociate themselves from their African heritage, as well as dissociate African heritage from the creation of the sophisticated indigenous African knowledge systems that shaped the world. As African-centered people who believe in the power of connecting to traditional African culture and heritage, we understand this dilemma. However, it is still a challenge to influence our beloved youth to gain an authentic and genuine love for their heritage and thus cultivate love for a very important part of themselves if we are unable to fully immerse in African-centered education and community. The current nationwide information war we are witnessing contains both positive and attractive trends, which presents unique challenges and opportunities. Tonight's presentation will present the findings of original research on the impact of an African-centered program on Black high school students that was led by IKG's cultural memory specialist and international community scholar, Anthony Broder, K.A. Nanasegu Karak. Implications of the research in particular for parents and teachers of students of African descent will also be presented. And the presentation will conclude the solutions oriented group discussion. Our presenter, Dr. Koyli Zakuri, was born and raised in Northern Virginia. He has a BA in journalism and mass communications and a minor in social entrepreneurship from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, as well as an MS in psychology and PhD in developmental psychology from Howard University. Both his master thesis and dissertation focused on exploring the impact of African-centered school-based programming on African-American, on American-African student racial and cultural identity, as well as American-African student learning. Prior to his recent graduate studies, he also studied ancient African comedic language for two years in Howard's Department of Africana Studies and has been facilitator of the Egypt on the Potomac field trip of Washington, DC for more than a decade. He is currently the Director of User Experience and Web Strategy in Howard's Office of University Communications. Additionally, he is involved in local efforts to force anti-racist reform of curriculum and pedagogy in Fairfax County Public Schools. Ultimately, his purpose is to help people of African descent acquire greater liberation and power, as well as chip away at the destructive colonist power structure. He is currently helping raise two children with his partner in Virginia and enjoys martial arts, being active, and becoming the highest expression of his true self. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Quayle Zakuri. Welcome, welcome, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, so honored to be here and a pleasure to be here and so honored to see many friends and family members and colleagues and people who I love and admire as well here. Thank you for the little Zoom icons. <laughs> um, this is different since I can't see anybody or hear anybody, hear your beautiful voices or face or see your beautiful faces. But um, yeah, no, I'm just glad to be here and share, you know, what I've learned and been able to, to learn in the last, I'll say 10 to 15 years. So it's kind of a culmination of a lot of things that I've looked at and studied and um, researched and and built with a lot of other people like part of a community so so first of all thanks to all my family and friends and colleagues who are here who are new to IKG probably never heard about it and it's really cool to see people from all over the country as well um thank you sister Ajo for inviting me and having me and putting up with me because I postponed doing I you know wisdom Wednesday this time for like I think over a couple of years because I was trying to finish the dissertation um at Howard University. Um, so thank you for being patient with me. Um, particular thank you to Baba Tony, Tony Anthony Browder, Baba Sekou Karak, and Deborah Watkins 
uh, for making this research possible. Um, this research is ultimately a result of my independent analysis of the program that we're going to talk about later in the presentation. Um, so they really made it possible, and I used the same data from my from my master's thesis and, and dissertation. So that was extremely valuable. Anybody who's been through a program knows that getting the data is a huge deal. So having access to such a valuable program um, was huge, was major. And Baba Tony's always been um, kind of a, a gate opener for me, even when he's not trying. Like I think we have a cosmic connection that um, he just always is there um, as a presence for me. Um, and it shows up. So I'm really appreciative of, uh, of both of them. Um, thanks to all who shared this presentation or just shared the link with other people. Um, and whoever is here, thank you for being here again. Thank you. Also, thank you for the IKG family who's here and present today. Um, I haven't been around as much the last, what, five or six years because of just being so busy, but I'm glad to be back. Um, so let's get started. So we already know the name of the presentation today. Um, I just wanted to start with just kind of reflecting it really quickly because this made me reflect a lot on my experience with IKG and how valuable it's been over the last, I guess, since graduating from undergrad in 2008, so really 15 years now. Um, it started with bugging, just happened to move around the corner from where the IKG office was and just started with bugging Baba Tony all the time, asking him questions, and he invited me to be a field trip facilitator, so I've been doing that. Um, and you know, I've kind of done a lot. I've been on the study tour. I've been on the excavation in, in Kemet. I've um, participated in middle passes workshops. I'm a part of the cultural circle, the Ivan Van Cernum cultural circle. Big shout out to the family that's here. Um, we're a study group, but we're also like a family. We've done so much. There's a picture of some of us in the top left-hand corner there. Um, I've also done this picture of us at an excavation in 2010, the excavation at the Asa Restoration Project. Bob, um, can you share your screen? Oh, you can't see it? Oh, shoot. Okay, <laughs> hold on. Forgot to do that. Okay, you see it now? You see it now, yes. Okay, well then this was the first slide. <laughs> Wait, can you go back and you were talking about the um, your beautiful IKG and I've been sitting my Yeah, I just wanted, so that was the title slide, but yeah, so yeah. So on the top left, it just, you know, we, we released a book it's a few years ago now. Um, been involved in the excavation. It's the bottom right hand corner. This is my fourth Wisdom Wednesday, actually. Um, the first three were obviously in person a long time ago. Um, you know, Baba Kojo, who I don't know if he's here, but um, and Tony and, and Baba Tony had, um, you know, uh, pushed me to do a presentation about my grandfather's work. Um, and I did that the first time. And the second presentation was about the pre Columbian African presence in the Americas. And the third presentation was part of uh, the Ivan Van Sertum Cultural Circle. We did a presentation about the book we published. Um, so, you know, this is the fourth one for me, um, the first virtual one. So, yeah, I'm just really grateful for that. I also want to dedicate, you know, I dedicated my work and I want to dedicate this presentation to my maternal grandparents who, you know, have been a huge influence posthumously on my life. Um, they were huge advocates of Black education, worked for HBCUs their entire lives. Um, my grandmother, you know, was an administrator, um, dean of students at Morgan State University and established a counseling program there. My grandfather was a pioneering historian um, of uh, Black history, um, helped establish it as an actual field of study in mainstream spaces, um, and just the, the and retired as the chair of the history department at Morgan State University as well. So, my work and uh, you know I see my own research as an extension of their legacy, and um, you know I can I hope you know I know they walk with me now, right? right? So um, I'm inspired by them and I, I want to continue to always uh, speak their names. So Dr. Ruth Brett Quarles and Dr. Benjamin Quarles. And I also want to just give a shout out to my scholarly inspirations, those who have most directly uh, influenced my work in this space specifically. So it really started with me reading the autobiography of Malcolm X when I was 13 years old and that changed everything for me um, completely. So if you haven't read that book, it's a must. Dr. Asa Hayy the third, uh, huge scholarly inspiration. Dr. Ivan Van Sertema, I'm putting the name of the books that were most influential for me. And of course, Anthony Browder um, in his book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization. And then two others, Dr. Mario Beatty and Dr. A. Wade Boykin from Howard University, um, both of which were on my dissertation committee and really influenced how I see things um, in the scholarly space. So shout out to all of them. There's a lot of other people I could say as well, including women, but these just happen to be the ones that have been most directly influential for me in this space. So what we're gonna talk about today, 
um, just an outline. So there's four parts. Uh, first, I want to set some foundations, then actually talk about the research and my findings. Um, and then, you know, I think, you know, there's a book by Dr. Manning, or Manning Marable, um, that's, uh, I think it's, it's called something like Notes from the Ebony Tower, right? We often talk about the ivory tower of being a space where there's scholarship, but like it's not shared with the community or like used for anything. And it happens even at HBCUs as well, right, at times. But I want to make sure that my research is actually applicable and useful and actually something that we can use. So I want to share some insights, but you know, during this presentation, I'm gonna pause at various parts to get your feedback because I really want to hear from everyone else because we all have experiences um, with raising children or being around children and our own selves, of course, growing and learning that I think is very valuable to share together because um, I only know what I know and the experiences that I've had, um, but that's limited, right? So we have 94 people here. So I really encourage you when we get to the parts where I ask for input and or, you know, answers to the questions in the chat, please, please participate if, if you feel I'm compelled to do so. Um, and also like, I'm gonna try my best to like, not get too deep into like, you know, the very psychological sounding terms and stuff like that. Um, but I'm also gonna explain certain things that not everyone might be familiar with, but like the, you know, IKG family and people who are into African centered um, spaces, you know, like who already kind of know that stuff, but I have to make sure everyone's kind of following along. So. Um, you know, bear with me, I will have to define some things as we go along. Um, so first, I mean, just in the in the title, you know, I realize some people don't understand what Africana really means, right? So Africana to me just means when you look, I'm a Pan-African, right? So I understand geo, like politically, socially, like there is power in seeing a, a global African family and understanding like this is something Malcolm X really advocated. Um, there's a lot of power in that and seeing the connections, right? And even the distinctions, but seeing the connective tissue. So Africana just refers to um, the approach of seeing and understanding and viewing things from the whole diaspora, the motherland, the diaspora here in the, the, the United States, like understanding that this connection across time and space. So time going back to antiquity, looking at what we can learn from our ancestors between now and antiquity. Um, so that's really what Africana means. So foundation. So first of all, just to start with, you know, I come from a place I studied at Howard University and there's other universities that have a similar thrust of like um, holding up African psychology or black psychology. And it's an important distinction to make because psychology, the origins are really not something that is uh, very nice, right? So first of all, the word psychology comes from the 1650s. It means study of the soul. It's a Greek, uh, has Latin roots, but it's a Greek word, study of the soul, right? And that's much deeper than just looking at behavior or habits or things like that that we study on the surface level. Um, I think it's ironic to actually even call what we do black psychology because the roots of the study of the soul is something that goes back to Africa in the first place. Um, you know, there's a sacred science that comes out of Africa that we're pulling from um, when we talk about black psychology. I think it's also ironic when we talk about black Greeks, right? The divine nine and black Greeks because the Greeks had to get their letters came from Africa in the first place. And they had to get they got their philosophy and all the things they hold sacred and people look at Greeks, the Greek civilizations as as being so sophisticated it all came from Africa right most of the people here know that. Um, so it's just this irony that we say black psychology or the black Greeks because we're pulling <laughs> we're going back to the source anyway. Um, I would instead I would say it's even we could call it a sacred healing tradition that we're talking about when we say black psychology. So with psychology, really, I'm not gonna get too deep, but like its origins are racist, right? So the people, the white men that founded this field of psychology in the United States uh, were social Darwinists. So they believed in the hierarchy of races. And of course, race is just a social construct. And they created these things to make sure that they maintain power and a hierarchy and they were at the top, right? And this social, if you, social Darwinism basically means white people up at the top. And then there's a hierarchy of other races, black people at the bottom. And that's what psychology's origins that's, that's the mentality of psychology's origins, the people that founded it. And they use psychology to really justify um, the inferior or the belief that black people are inferior, right? That's literally what it was used for. It was a pseudoscience in many areas because it was trying to prove that as opposed to really being a science and seeking knowledge. Um, it comes from people that had an Anglo-Saxon value system, and we're gonna talk more about that, but basically that, yeah, is racist. And, a distinct black psychology really begins in the mid 1960s when you know black power movement was a, a starting and occurring and in, in, in full effect by the end of that decade and students were demanding 
um, inclusion into psychology programs, but also, you know, at the same time saying we want our own space, right? Like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said it, you know, someone who was an integrationist said it best when he said, we're trying to integrate into a burning building. So a lot of people also said, well, we're going to figure out our own stuff. We don't need to be a part of the racist spaces and try to demand being a part of it. We can do our own thing. And that's how the Association of Black Psychologists came to be in 1968. And that's really, that organization has really been the steward of Black psychology since that time. So it's been decades, obviously, and it's been, and they're very essential, that organization is very essential to establishing and maintaining this tradition. Um, one quote, just to kind of put that into context from the book, Seeking the Saku, um, doc, by Dr. Wade Nobles, who's one of the founders of ABSI. And he says, quote, Black psychology is something more than a psychology of the so-called underprivileged peoples, more than the experience of living in ghettos and more than the genocidal atrocity of being forced onto the dehumanizing con condition of slavery. It's more than the darker dimension of general psychology. psychology. Its unique status is derived not from the negative aspects of being black and white America, but rather from the positive features of basic African philosophy, which dictate the values, customs, attitudes, and behavior of Africans in America and the so-called new world. So some major differences with black psychology and psychology generally is of course our interest is in the black community or African descent community and uh, what can we what our research can do to help our community um, putting it into action um, that is the purpose right um, it has to do with the black what but Manning Marable calls the black intellectual tradition you'll see you have scholars but you activist scholars what are we doing with this research that makes it worthwhile it's not just knowledge for knowledge sake or knowledge to oppress them but it's knowledge to empower um, the worldview comes from looking at the worldview of African culture and philosophy. Um, and it's a much different worldview than that has shaped that the one that has shaped psychology and America as a whole, um, which comes from, again, Anglo-Saxonism, which we'll talk more about. If anyone's interested in learning more about the Black psychology tradition, I encourage you to look up Afia and Billy Shaka. She recently did, I think, an online course about Black psychology for the public. Um, you don't have to be enrolled in the program to see that course, but I think yeah, she's on Instagram, Psychotherapy. Um, she's doing great work. Dr. Fia, Fia and Billy Shaka, also a Howard grad. Um, so check her out if you want to learn more about um, this tradition. Okay. So this is a model that I constructed um, as part of a basically to show the basis of the of my research and what I'm trying to accomplish and what um, the problem in the first place is, right? So in my academic program, the outcome um, that we I chose to look at was academic outcomes, which you can see on the very end. But I think, you know, the stuff we're talking about really doesn't just apply to academic outcomes. I'm more interested in learning generally, right? Because we know that academic spaces, K through 12 are very biased. Um, there's it's just it's not as important as um, it is very important those outcomes because it determines our success clearly in this world, but at the same time, like it is an indicator from mainstream society that's biased. And we have to look at the deeper levels of learning that we can achieve and other outcomes, such as just you know, well being and, and safety and things of those uh, things of that nature. So I would put all types of outcomes in that last box really to expand this model in the future. But this model starts with CCH, which is, I define uh, curricular cultural hegemony, hegemony, curricular cultural hegemony. And um, to give you an, uh, my definition of that is this, it's the systematic and oftentimes deliberate exclusion from curriculum of the contributions across time and space of Africana people and civilizations to knowledge production and application, as well as the implicit bureaucratic framing and depiction of people of African descent and systematic severing of historical events and trends from the present day circumstances of black people. So this is the problem, right? This is not the only problem that's impacting academic outcomes at all, but I think this is one large dimension that's been very overlooked that we need to like study more in depth. And this is a model to hopefully expand that process. Curricular or hegemony period is an overbearing and omnipresent structure within mainstream schooling and that negatively impacts our youth, whether we're conscious of it or not. A key aspect of cultural hegemony is control of information, which includes presenting misinformation as well as framing information in a certain way, and of course, completely excluding information. But I will say one of the best ways to lie to people is to give you just a piece of the information, right? Um, as opposed to the full story, right? That's actually more useful. If I tell you, hey, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, we need to go invade a 
right away and make sure we're safe, et cetera. I've just given you part of the story. If you just let fear overtake you and say, let's do it. Well, you've been, you've allowed yourself to be lied to, right? It takes two parties for a lie to occur. Um, you have to accept the lie for that process and transaction to actually complete, right? So we need to ask the questions. If I give you A, B, and C, what happened to D through Z, right? It's, it's on us to ask those questions and do that for ourselves because we know we've been lied to historically by all these mainstream spaces and um, institutions of, of, in, of uh, socialization, not just the school system. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history of mainstream education in this country as well to put things into context. I put some books there um, that have been essential to my own understanding of this and that have shown and proven kind of what I'm talking about. So feel free to Google those books, but those are really some of the best books um, that show what I'm talking about. Um, but essentially what happens in the Americas, we know, you know, people of African descent, it was a crime to learn to read, right? before, um, during the, his, the period of enslavement in this country uh, for black people or people enslaved to, to, to learn how to read or write or get any type of education. And yet we still strove for it. So there's always been a connection between liberation and education and always you know, something that we valued so much as seeing as part of our liberation. But all the same, there have been independent Africans, Af uh, black schools um, in the South before enslavement ended antebellum and the postbellum period right away. As soon as enslavement ended, there was a proliferation of independent black schools. It didn't matter if all they had was a room, right? Everybody was gonna try to learn to read and be and, and get more free, right? So as this push happened and as black people really pushed the government to support a common school system or a public school system um, because they'd been not included in any type of education, um, the federal government actually kind of takes control of that process and starts to establish the public school system. But in doing so, a racist ideology is integrated into that entire process. Um, because really what happens is the, the whole system initially was not meant to educate. It was meant to socialize everyone into Anglo-Saxon values because the people that were in power wanted everyone to be like them, right? What happened in the early 1900s is where there were a lot of European immigrants coming in and the Europeans that they didn't like, Eastern Europeans. And they said, well, we can't stop all this immigration, but we want to make sure that they're like us. They need to adopt our values if they're coming. So we're going to school them, essentially, right? And to school everyone into our system, make sure they are good citizens and abide by um, the power structure we want to maintain. Anglo-Saxonism comes from Anglo-Saxons from Europe. And Anglo-Saxonism is really defined by what we actually consider American values today, which are very destructive values, right? And this is some of the stuff that's still regurgitated in the school system rugged individualism, materialism, individualism, valuing cognition or thinking above emotion, things that really throw people out of balance and have caused, in my opinion, as part of the reason we're in a period where the climate is, is so messed up and we're getting to, we have an existential crisis that's really building up. It's because of these values in capitalism, right? It's so ingrained into the system. And then you can fast forward into the 60s and 70s when there was this huge push for black history and ethnic studies that occurred as part of the black power movement and the other civil rights movements occurring, which was pretty successful. Like there was a black, lot of history, you know, uh, uh, black studies programs established, black history becomes more integrated in American history, et cetera. But it only went so far, right? The system is going to bend just enough to make sure that we are appeased and get what we feel we need. And it's not going to go any further. Well, it's going to go enough so that we quiet down, right? The system will always adjust, as we've seen in the last few years, of, after all the blowback from um, police, you know, violence and things of that nature. Like the system's going to bend enough until we quiet down. So that's what happened. So really, at the same time, we do see textbooks get reformed, and there's more black um, people talked about in textbooks and the American history textbooks and etc. But this this reform is really just surface level, right? They include some more black people. And we all know there's token black people that include in black history conversations every year, black history month, et cetera, but like it becomes kind of empty and hollow because it's always the same, right? And so it only went so far, these K through 12 textbooks um, and some of them are really still really bad, but that's how far, like it didn't go any further. Like it really all depends on how you frame things, right? You can talk about slavery, but if you talk about slavery as like, well, they actually were not, it wasn't so bad, right? Like slave masters took care of their, their enslaved people and stuff like that. Like you can frame things in a way to really 
make them look different than they were. And that's what really happens in textbooks to this day. Um, so this problem is still a huge problem and it impacts our psychological well-being, the psychological violence, I would say, that we, that we have all around us all the time. So that's, that's the problem we're trying to address here. Also going back to the academic outcomes or something we talk about, which is, or mainstream society talks about the academic achievement gap, which over the last several decades, when you look at mainstream academic indicators, um, especially like nationwide test taking and, and math and reading, um, one of the tests is called the NAEP or the National Assessment of Educational Progress. There's been this gap between black students and white students. And even as scores have gone up, this gap has remained. And really, we can just attribute that to racism, just like many other indicators of, of well-being that we see black people are much worse off in terms of health and things of that nature. The, the common factor is racism. And why do we know that? Because when you look at SES or, or social economic uh, status is not actually, when, so I put it this way, when you look at wealthy black people and poor white people, oftentimes educational outcomes and health outcomes are the same. So SES is not really like having more money is not necessarily helping us, right? So there's a there's a fact there's something else happening that's determining these outcomes, and I I think we can um, attribute that to ultimately to racism on multiple levels and the stress that it causes. So I'm gonna re revisit this model later and talk about the two boxes in the middle in a second. But before we get to that, I have a question. Um, so for anyone in the audience, what instances of misinformation? and or truthful critical information, maybe you got some good stuff in, in your schooling, in your education, have you experienced or witnessed in the curriculum? What was the impact? What happened? So I'm gonna give you just like a minute to kind of put your answers in the chat. If anybody wants to share. And as and when we move on, feel free to continue to add, you know, your answers to the chat. And if nobody wants to answer, it might be a deep question or something it takes a while to think about, we can move on. Okay, so, so give us a minute and um, I think we're going to start having some come through the chat. Just give us a second to type. Oh, I see some coming in now. So peace, Brielle and, um, and Pam. Thank you for being here. Thanksgiving, Shakespeare, British literature is the pinnacle of literature. Columbus did discover America, Atlantis. <laughs> Benevolent slave owners, founders as heroes and perfect. That's one that really gets to me too. Civilization began in Mesopotamia as well. That's another one that's still problematic. Right, no black historical figures back in the day, very damaging. Right, pilgrims were the benevolent to the Indians. I stopped cel I mean, I stopped celebrating um, Thanksgiving um, as much as family. It's a family and you know time, but you know it's still connected to a very problematic history. Being taught Egyptians were white and not black. That's a big one. We always talk about the IKG. Someone, uh, Will says, uh, talk about the Greek letters in the opening. Can I explain further? So there are current actual uh, script, the Rome comes from the Romans. If you look at its lineage and you can check out Baba Tony's book, but it, it basically came from the Greek alphabet, which came from the Phoenicians from Africa, from ancient Kemet. So you can actually trace this, but these letters come from Africa in the first place, uh, from the Medunetra or the hieroglyphs as a lot of people say. American holidays, that's a big one for me, trying to get away from the holidays that uh, are very commercialized and really are about capitalism. Okay, so great answers. Thank you. Yeah, you can continue to put them in, but I'll move forward. So um, that second box in that model was about beliefs and racial identity construction. Um, when you look at the literature, the existing literature on racial identity construction, you do see that there is a there's a mixed story in terms of racial identity aspects and how they impact um, academic outcomes for black students. So there's this variance. What I think that variance is basically based on is your beliefs that are attached to being black or blackness, right? Racial meaning is socialized, constructed, and is contextual, right? So we are given cues all around us all the time. 
um, that tell us what to believe about being Black or what to believe about a lot of different characteristics of people. This is part of this hegemonic structure. Um, what's really important here to think about, oh, let me, are these so-called, I don't even want to use that word master, but like these story, these, these dominant storylines and narratives. This is something that you see across curriculum and across the media. Like there are storylines that pervade society that tell us how to think about people. They're related to stereotypes. In fact, they precede stereotypes and help inform the stereotypes we have. These storylines and narratives are quote, dominant framings of the experience and reality of a group of people that pervade society and people's beliefs. They're vehicles for both how individuals make sense of race and how they appropriate and deploy race to position themselves and others in everyday activity. Their function is to maintain social order, specifically racial hierarchy. They're not created in schools necessarily, but they're filtered, reproduced, reimagined, and enacted there, meaning they draw from the worldview and the ethos of society at large. So as a result of the history of race and racism experienced by Black folk in America, narratives of Black deficiency continue to dominate and limit access to power. So one, for example, might be that Black male students are unintelligent, lazy, and you know, inclined towards criminality. And when you have that narrative and a white teacher has that narrative of a Black student, they're going to treat them like, as it, you know, with that belief system. And they're going to turn them into people that, um, have problems in school and they get that's why black students get suspended at such higher rates right this belief system um, really dictates our experience in schooling and education and it's, it's it's really just important to understand them and deconstruct them and we can see proof of these um, by something by Claude Steele Claude Steele is a scholar that came up with this term stereotype threat right and stereotype threat basically means that when you know there's a stereotype about you or about your the group that you belong to, um, it actually impacts how what what you're able to do because it's always lingering there. So stereotype that, for example, um, might mean that if you if a stereotype is even for women, like if a stereotype is that women um, are not good at math, it's something that's going to be in your head. And if I just activate that with the cue in the environment, it's going to literally activate in your brain and it's going to matter. So it's like there's been studies that show when you activate that type of stereotype threat in someone's brain, like psychological studies show that it makes an impact on your test taking ability, for example. So if these things are always present, teachers, you know, reemphasize them sometimes, most of the time, probably not on purpose, but it happens. There's cues in your environment, there's cues in movies, there's cues in the curriculum. So all these things come together um, to make sure that these, these dominant storylines and narratives are always present. So the one that I'm most interested in examining and figuring out, and there's also the dual nature of, of, of narratives. There are also, of course, good narratives, right? Or positive narratives that we can draw from and that we wanna construct and intentionally put into the minds of our youth and ourselves. Um, and that's what we do here at IKG. The storyline that I looked at specifically in my research here is what I call the knowledge production and application storyline. So I think there is this storyline that people will have, well, non-white people, don't create knowledge, that it all comes from Europe or white people. And I mean, there's a reason for that, right? In American history, there's been many inventions that actually people of African descent created, but of course they could, we couldn't get patents, we couldn't get trademarks, so it, white man took credit, right? So there's so many instances of that just in recent history, but when you look at knowledge as an as a, as a intellectual genealogy or as a, as a history, because knowledge is just built upon and built upon, there's nothing new under the sun, right? But we have to understand that knowledge production and, and, and application at its very most sophisticated form was practiced in Africa thousands of years ago. Um, and we're not told this narrative. And this is something that we try to do at IKG, make sure that people understand that. Um, but this is the storyline that I want to really, that I really have focused on and want to impact. So I just want to, you know, this is a good example of a storyline. Um, so this was an image from a textbook in Texas in 2014. And I mean, you can kind of see if anyone wants to real quick put in the chat, like, what is, <laughs> what's the problem with this caption box? Nasir is a scholar and also the name of Nas, my favorite hip hop artist. So you can see in the caption, they refer to enslaved Africans as workers, right? That's what I'm talking about. Like when you frame something a certain way, it's whole different situation, whole different context. So there was a uh, uh, a black for uh, in high, there was a black student in high school, and 
his mother, 2014, saw this and made a whole lot of noise about it and, and, and complained to the um, textbook manufacturer. I think it was Macmillan. I can't remember now, actually. But they ended up apologizing and changing it. But this was just one instance, right? How many more instances are there? Probably even coming, re-emerging now with uh, some right-wing people being in power across the country. Um, but it's good she made, um, it's good she, she, she drew, you know, called attention to this. But again, how many more instances are just overlooked, right? So that's one storyline we just want to erase, obviously, completely. But another storyline that's problematic, we talk about slavery, we talk about enslavement of our ancestors, and that's where we start our story oftentimes, right? We don't start what with what happened before slavery. And if you look at this knowledge production and application storyline, we can go back thousands and thousands, like literally tens of thousands of years to Africa and the sophistication that was happening with knowledge and knowledge production. And so... Of course, we need to talk about slavery, but we need to couch it in a, and contextualize it properly and say that this is something that happened way late in the game, honestly. It's very prevalent for us because it's the last 500 years, 400 years that we're talking about, um, at least the, the, the Atlantic slave trade. Um, but it's not something we need to start with. And it's something we also need to, we need to focus on the resilience of our ancestors in this history and not so much of just how we were treated because that resilience and resistance, there was resistance from day, from the first second anybody tried to snatch somebody out of Africa up to the present. There was a resistance across the board, but we don't, we're not told that story either, right? So that's something we need to also be very aware of, these two storylines. So moving on to racial identity. So racial identity is obviously like an, a very amorphous type of concept, right? It's, 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 it's something that is very complex. Um, race in the first place is a social construct created by white men to maintain their own power, right? But it is also something that's very much um, a part of our psyche now. So it is something we have to address. It's not that something we can ever avoid. So racial identity is important to study. And I know in, in the African centered space, we often say, hey, let's stop referring to ourselves as black people because we're you know, tying into that mentality as opposed to saying we're a people of African descent or something that's more intentional. Right, so when I say black, I'm really just saying it today for uh, the purpose of convenience because it's a short way to refer to us. But I think you know it's really better to say we are people of African descent to connect to a place in a in a space in Africa, and a in a history. Right, so there's many different frameworks in a psychological space to assess racial identity. There are some that are generic that can look at just ethnic identity for any group. I think it's really important to make sure in a black psychology space that we are using tools that are created specifically for us. So this is the tool that I used or the framework, the multidimensional model of racial identity, which was created by Robert Sellers in 1998. And this is multidimensional, meaning that it looks at seven different aspects. Oh, someone said Baker's Rebellion. I'm going to come back to that, actually. Um, but someone, uh, uh, there's all these different dimensions of racial identity to be assessed. And you know, the way that obviously you assess someone's racial identity is you take a survey, an instrument, right? So you fill out, uh, you answer a bunch of questions and um, your score in any of these dimensions determine whether you're high or low in these dimensions, right? So this model has seven of them and you can see the definitions here. So centrality, how salient basically your racial identity is within your overall identity. And I can hypothesize and be pretty confident that non-white people um, their race or ethnicity is very salient for them or central to their identity because it's so prevalent because they're confronted. We are confronted with it all the time. And I think I would bet for a lot of white people, it's not the same story. Racial identity is probably not as much of a salient thing for them. Private regard, how one feels about their own, uh, about black people, about American Africans as a group. Public regard, one's perception of how other people uh, look at black people. And then there's four ideologies uh, sub or, or dimensions. And you can see them there. Um, so nationalist, it's not political nationalism, but it's just the importance and uniqueness of being uh, uh, African-American. How you, are you high or low that? Do you believe that or do you not so much believe that? Determines if you are high or low and how you'll score in that dimension. Assimilationist, seeing yourself as really just American and not so much it's important to be of African descent. It's just like, I'm American. Humanist, seeing the connection between yourself and humans around the world and minorities seeing the commonalities between people of African descent and other oppressed groups. So solidarity there. So I want you to look at these. So I have another question to consider. 
So for yourself, looking at these dimensions, I want to do, you know, have a develop a hypothesis. I want to start with the scientific method. So for yourself, pick one or more of these dimensions and predict whether you would score high or lower if you took the survey and why. Or for someone you admire, pick one of these dimensions or more than one dimension and predict where how they would score, right? And you obviously don't know for certain until you take until you were actually take this. Uh, the tool that's associated with the MM with the with this uh, uh, framework for racial identity, um, but it's just I think a good exercise to think about. So I'm gonna give you a second to to think about that and, and um, put it in the chat. I'd be interested, especially to see you know about someone you admire and, and what you think they will score. Oh, and also one other thing to mention, the MMRI is specifically supposed to be for American Africans, not for just anyone of African descent, because we have a specific historical context and experience that's reflected in these dimensions that might not be exactly the same for people of African descent from elsewhere. So if anyone wants to drop it in the chat, please do. If not, we'll move on. So Baba Paul says Malcolm X, high in all subscales. Well, I would think he's, when you say subscales, I would think, you know, assimilationist, he would definitely couldn't be high in that, right? He would be very low in assimilationist, I think. And so these aspects, you know, we have a very, because of our experience, we have, you know, things are complicated, right? So just because one has a high nationalist, like you would think, I would think that they have a low assimilationist, right? But it's very possible to have both, right? So this scale doesn't assume that just because you have a high score or expression level in one, that you would have a low expression level in another, but you could probably show that like overall on average, having a high nationalist, you probably have a low assimilationist, but again, it's not gonna be for everyone necessarily. But you can probably see a trend if you looked at like um, a population and, and took the survey. So, so James says I pick one, three, and four would have a high score. No doubt. I think the same for me, actually. I haven't. I don't even know if I've ever taken this because I've just implement you know <laughs> implemented with people many times now. It would be a really fun exercise if everyone could just take the survey and then we could look at our look at the trend, uh, but maybe another day. Okay, so moving on, thank you for uh, putting your thoughts in the chat. Okay, so looking at black racial identity and academic outcomes. So overall, I mean, I had to look at a lot of literature to understand what's been done, um, but there's two studies that really helped kind of couch the overall trends. One's by Kevin Coakley, who's a Black psychologist, very much a part of Association of Black Psychologists and someone who's a great scholar, um, basically has wrote an article that summarized his findings that, um, or actually it's in a book, um, but those are the factors he says have a, and these are factors that have a positive relationship with academic, with, with, with stronger academic outcomes. Um, so embracing one's Blackness, connecting to Black community, being aware of the racism around you, and even valuing and embracing other people and cultures. And I'm not even saying like white culture, but like the dominant culture, but like just other peoples of the world. That actually is a good thing when you look at academic outcomes. And then another study, which was an actual scientific meta study, meta analysis by Miller, Koto and Burns said private regards to how, how black people view themselves, ethnic identity exploration and ethnic identity expression. So things that, you know, again, being a part of IKG, we have a chance to kind of do these things and practice them as well. So overall, these aspects lead to a better academic outcome for people of African descent in America. So one more thing to, to give us a foundation here, this concept of maroonage, right? And so the historical maroons, like, like I said earlier, every, in every instance where there was African slavery and probably any type of subjugation around the world, there was, was resistance on multiple levels, always. 
you know, the picture they paint of people just being kind of like going with it. And some people did, but like there was always resistance. And so the historical Maroons were, were people that freed themselves, that ran away from the plantocracy, whether in Brazil or in Cuba or in South Carolina or Virginia or wherever, where there was a plantocracy and an enslavement structure and formed their own communities in places that they could stay away from the plantocracy. And even then, uh, disrupted the plantocracy, the, the, the whole economic system. So the one on the left is uh, is a depiction of, for, uh, for example, Gaspar Yanga in Mexico in the 1500s who escaped um, after being enslaved and formed a very successful Maroon community um, in the mountains and that actually fought with the Spanish and were successful and the Spanish could not beat them and subjugate them. So they had to recognize this Maroon community as a town, a free town, and to this day, and they changed the name of the town later to Yanga. So that's in Mexico today. There's a big statue there. Um, actually, my son is named after him. Um, there's other depictions here, like even Capoeira, the martial arts that comes that forms in Brazil is a form of resistance. Um, even like looking at Santeria, Santeria or Condomble, you know, spiritual traditions that very much are attached to like resisting the push or forcing us to uh, 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 embrace Christianity or European religions. Um, so these are the historical Maroons. It's about resistance. And there's a quote here I want to read that's really important from Dr. Asa Hilliard. And he said, let me make a clear distinction between simple escape or simple freedom and maroonage. Simple escape and simple freedom are liberty without an aim. Maroonage, on the other hand, was freedom for the purpose of survival and cultural continuity. Not all enslaved people became Maroons or even aspired to do so. Some chose rather to make the best of the slave system. Between the poles of slavery and freedom, there are many ways of responding. And I think that last sentence is so essential because to be a person of African descent in America or in anywhere where there's been a slavery, like it's a constant negotiation, right? Resisting being a part of the status quo and the institutions that are dictated by white supremacy how much you can do that or choose to do that, how much you choose to be separate or independent and find other avenues, you know, like we all are constantly doing that negotiation and figuring out how we do that, right? So I think to his point, there's just so many ways to do that and we all have a different way of doing that and choose different levels in terms of how, how far away we get from the matrix, right? So that's an important point that we're gonna revisit. I think it's important too, even for white people to understand Maroonage and look at white abolitionists and look up to them for inspiration. Um, you know, like John Brown, and I'm gonna talk about him later more. But, you know, I think that's, you know, that's how I think white people can also connect to thinking about Maroonage. It's like, there were white abolitionists who were uh, even supporting the Maroons, right? So um, this is the historical Maroon. So how does that translate into what's important for this discussion? Well, Maroonage then is just the act of of finding a separate space um, to do things for our liberation collectively, right? And there's many different ways to do that. In the academic literature or in the psychological literature, they call it counter spaces, right? And there's different levels to this, right? You could have a counter space where basically it's a setting for, you know, an oppressed group that says we're gonna intentionally challenge the oppressive nature of the larger and dominant mainstream space in our space here. We're gonna establish this space. So you could do that at home. You could do that within a school system with a program in a school system. You could go further and say, we're gonna establish our own schools, our own school system, right? But of course that's, that's a huge endeavor, um, but there's many different levels to that. Um, you could even do this digitally nowadays, right? You could do it at a community center, create a space where you have the time and control of the conversation. And that's what we've always done. So it can happen again in mainstream educational study spaces. One thing that emerged in the last few decades is this notion of ethnic studies. Um, and I just want to mention like ethnic studies, when you have when it's in a when it's in a mainstream space, is hugely beneficial to the, the people that it's focusing on. So one one of the biggest, most well-researched examples is in Tucson, Arizona in 2008. Uh, to 2012, there was a study that looked at this Mexican American studies program. And for Latinx students, if they took at least one course in this program that was established in the school system, they were more likely to graduate on time and did much better in uh, the standardized um, testing, right? Now, these are two very standard academic outcomes that are important in academia, but all of us who are, you know, look at academia 
alternatively and say like these are not measurements we want to just adhere to and say these are the things we want to look to do um but the fact is the studies have shown that when you do ethnic studies and you talk and you give a people their heritage they do much better in school and they feel like they belong in that system and they will achieve and of course what happened when this when it was shown that how successful this program was the superintendent of that school system killed the program and it went all the way to the Supreme Court eventually, and they ruled that that was unconstitutional, but the disruption had already occurred, right? And I think it's still going today, but um, something to look up and really understand, um, you know, but, you know, a superintendent who's supposed to be saying, we want the best for all of our students, looked at this and said, well, it's racist, it's reverse racism. You're teaching them, when you teach them about their history and how they've been oppressed by white people, then you're teaching is reverse racism, right? So he killed that program. And obviously he wasn't interested in their empowerment. Um, but I suggest you look that up, Mexican-American studies program. Then of course we have African study, African-centered education, right? And that's, I'm gonna define that in a second. These images here, you can see the top, I mean, it's a historical image of a family reading. And then at the bottom, these are like, you know, there's, I'm gonna talk more about banned books, um, but these are like, as books have been banned in a lot of spaces, especially in the last few years, there have been a lot of people who have intentionally said, okay, make sure we have these books at the front of the bookstore, at the front of the library, because if you're banning them, then we want to make sure people are actually reading them. So the irony of banning a book is that it becomes even more well-known and probably widespread at times. So to consider, what strategies can you offer to build and support maroonage or counter spaces for you, your family, and or your community? So that could be just imagining right now, or it could be something that you have already seen and done yourself. I'm not sure the answer to your question, Marsha. I'm not a Maroon scholar per se, but um, I can suggest, I'm gonna give you my email address at the end of the presentation. I can suggest several books that probably have that answer. Homeschooling. And actually, um, I was gonna talk about this later, but homeschooling right now is at an all time high, especially for black families. I think it started before the pandemic it was around 3% and it's gone up to about 15% of black students now are homeschooled. And that is maroonage, certainly. Supporting African center education, that's maroonage, counter space, cool. Okay, we'll continue to put those answers in there as you, if you think about more. Building our own museum, supporting the donating centers like IKG, African Center Co-ops, study circles. Definitely, thank you. So what is African-centered education? It's a multifaceted orientation of educating children of African descent that maintains a worldview and perspective with Africa and African descendants at the center. It infuses Africana cultural elements, such as heritage, knowledge, and a connectedness, cultural socialization, as well as aspects of fundamental culture, such as communalism, harmony, justice, and integrity of spirit and matter, into curriculum, pedagogy, policy, and practices. All that to say, like, you are walking the walk when you, do, when you practice this and engage in this. Cultural continuity just refers to the process of, like, connecting to the culture of the past, engaging in Sankofa. Um, when I say fundamental culture, it's not just about like wearing a dashiki, but it's about, are we actually doing things in a communal way? Are we making sure that the group well-being is emphasized beyond above the one individual? What you see in a lot of mainstream education is a reflection of the individualism of America. There's always competition. The best students win, they get a prize. As opposed to, why don't you get a prize for making sure that your whole class understands a concept, right? There should be a test score for how well you support other people in your circle but that's not the ethos of this society. But that might be something that you see in African-centered space. Um, also being genuine about the sacred nature of, of reality. Um, in Af traditional African culture, spirit is not, spirit is just infused. You don't have to necessarily say it's a religion. Spirit and, and the concept of things being sacred is infused into everything, into science, into every tradition, right? So that is something that you would see in an African-centered space. So African center schools are ultimately what we want to see prosper. Um, and there's, you know, scope, there's a scope, the scope in space. So 
you can have an African center school that might be a charter school, but then if they are a charter school, of course, they're beholden to the school system, which can compromise their purpose, right? But it still is an African center space. There's still benefit to that. You might have an African center program in a mainstream school. There's still, a, you know, definitely value there. But ultimately, if you have a completely independent space for African center education that's independently funded, and then you don't have you're not beholden to anyone else. That is the space that would truly be a, a full-fledged African center space. And there's some African, there's some teachers on in this call that um, work at African center schools, Kamau and others. Like, I really, really respect you all because it is, I know that, you know, it's so our teachers are so important and being in those spaces is so important. And I know like it, funding and things of that nature are often a, a problematic in these spaces, but people continue to persist. And it's so important for, the, for you all to continue to do so. So I give you all props and I'm thankful for your efforts, uh, especially Brother Kamal. <laughs> um, so, you know, part of the uh, purpose of african Center education is not only to make sure that we see things from an african Center perspective, from our own viewpoint, essentially, but also to achieve uh, a higher level of maroonage, so self-sufficiency, sovereignty, liberation, like true sovereignty, right? Having our own businesses and really not being beholden to this matrix, right? So that is a very high onus to achieve, but that is the ultimate purpose, self-determination and sovereignty and a true infusion of your worldview into everything you do. And yeah, please, if you have any other programs or schools that you know of, put them in the chat so we can start to document more of these. Um, so yeah, how well an African center program or space is able to achieve these objectives depend on how much, how, you know, how well it's, what its capacity is, how much uh, funding it has and how, how well it's able to disconnect itself from mainstream society and it's, uh, and the, this education system, because obviously it is counter to the, to the education or the schooling system that we see. And here's some images from a really, um, successful uh, school uh, educational space, the Betty Shabazz International Charter School in Chicago, um, run by Carol Lee, Dr. Carol Lee, who's an amazing scholar and educa educator. Um, and in fact, her husband is Dr. Haki Marabuti, who's the founder of Third World Press Books, one of the few Black publishers still around. Um, and these are some photos from there just to give you an idea of how this looks. I just use these images because I could get them from their website. So that was easy. <laughs> so the program that I focused on for this study, though, was an African-centered school-based program, right? So meaning it, is, it, meaning it was limited, right? Because 100% it was necessary. I think, you know, but you have to be realistic about doing that, having a counter space within a mainstream space, like it's going to be limited because you're beholden to the school administration and it's limited in terms of how much exposure students are getting, right? They're seeing, they're in a school system that in totality has Anglo-Saxon values applied and they just get this one space to, to be different, right? And that's gonna have an impact hopefully, but we have to be realistic about how far that impact can go as opposed to like a full-fledged African center space. So there is some research out there about African center school-based programs. My own master's and dissertation now have contributed to that literature. Um, and there's also rites of passage programs that are African center that have also seen similar outcomes to what I'm gonna talk about. Um, some of those outcomes include social change, involvement beliefs, communal orientation, school connectedness, motivation to achieve, collectivism, um, positive Black identity, liberatory youth activism, increased awareness of racism, um, Afrocentric values, and physical appearance self-worth. These are all some of the outcomes that we've seen from school-based programming that's African-centered. So the research here is limited in the science, you know, it's the scientific research, and this was one part of my motivation to, to do this research myself, to make sure that it's better documented and we understand it more. And I'm going to talk more about that, of course, in a little bit. So one last thing in terms of setting our foundation, Africana Attainment Heritage Cultural Orientation, AAHCO. So this is a mouthful, sounds super psycho, you know, psychological and all that, but like AAHCO is a construct that I created as part of my master's thesis um, with the support of my um, 
just a, my advisor at the time, Dr. A. Wade Boykin, who um, you know is a black psychologist, has done amazing work throughout his life. Um, and it's you know you can see the definition there. Um, and to create this, I was really just inspired by by people of African descent that I've witnessed over the years that I've been inspired by, who I felt like had you know certain characteristics that came together to help them become successful and be who they were. Right. So there's the central premise is that is there's a two way relationship between one's Africana heritage engagement and an inclination to to do things with excellence. And that the two are related. Right. Because when you look at your heritage and you can find the excellence in that heritage, you then it then becomes a part of your psyche. Right. And you attribute the I can't say which one precedes the other, but there is a two way relationship there. And I witnessed this. I've witnessed this in a lot of people that I really respect. And I've noticed that when that I think that when you see a high level of this, um, you are just much more likely to be successful, right? You have high standards, right? You do things with intention. Um, and Baba Tony was definitely one of the biggest inspirations for creating this construct, the psychological construct. Um, and I'm gonna talk more about this, but Africana Attainment Heritage Cultural Orientation. So if you see the acronym AAHCO later, <laughs> this is what it's referring to. So to, to consider, who do you know or know of that you think embodies Africana Attainment Heritage Cultural Orientation? Again, a, an orientation, almost like a personality, um, some characteristics that, that hold together um, for people that are successful and empowered. So who do you think would embody if they took the, the survey that we constructed to assess this and measure it in people, who do you think would uh, score highly? It could be yourself. So Tony Browder, Minister Louis Farrakhan, who else you got? Dr. Carr at Howard University, Asa Hilliard. Dr. Van Sertema. How about some women? Kola Abimbola, not familiar. Dr. Africana Chihobori Kwao. Dr. Clark, Dr. Ben. John, a. John Henry Clark, James Small, Dr. Jeffries, Dr. Francis Kresswell, Ashada Shakur and Angela Davis, I was thinking about them as well, Dr. Ramni, Zora Neale Hurston, certainly. Oh, peace, Chuck. I know you're here, Chuck. This was up. Wendy Manuel Scott, I'm not familiar with, with her or him. These are some names I will look up after the presentation. Thank you for sharing. Betty Shabazz, certainly. Marcus Garvey, certainly. Priscilla Junji, Dr. Joy DeGray, great. Yeah, nice, thank you. So let's move on. So just keep this in mind, AAHCO. So now transitioning. So my research and purpose, of course I wanted to get degrees. And I will say like, if anybody, you know, I was very fortunate in my program. You know, I work at Howard University to this day. I've been there 13 years and it's been a huge benefit for me because we, I get tuition remission as a, as a staff member, right? So if you're ever looking to, you know, <laughs> fund your education because, and not get into debt because this system is, is so terrible. We put all our money in, the, this country puts all its money into military and that's a, actually educating its citizenry. Um, and so that's why we see a situation really to my, in my opinion, that's why we see a situation where everyone's in debt. I had professors in my program that are still in heavy debt, right? So you, 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 you get a degree and then you're in debt and you're beholden to just paying back that debt forever, right? That should never be the case. But um, I was very fortunate to, to avoid that because I worked at the university. So if you're ever looking for a way to fund your education, get a job at a university. So I, my purpose though, is to better understand the impact of African-centered programming the impact and then how and why that impact could occur, right? So like, again, I think we all can kind of agree that these things are gonna, engaging with your heritage is gonna benefit you. But I wanna show scientifically like, how is it benefiting us? 
because then we can really pick apart like what are the best ways to implement a program, right? To really understand this process more specifically and the nuances of it. And then develop and test AAHCO, right? So it's a construct we came up with, or I came up with, with some support of others. And I wanna understand, is it useful? Is it valid, right? Is it something that we can use to assess um, outcomes for a program? Um, is it a framework that can support our positive development, right? So that's also my purpose. And then again, to add to the literature and make the case for this type of programming, there's millions of dollars that are wasted in the educational space every year, right? And people say they wanna uh, uh, close the, the, the achievement gap or the opportunity gap really what, is, what, it, what it should be called. And I wanna show like, well, if this is something that you can show has a positive impact, well, this is where the money should go, right? Let's use that money to support Maroonage. And again, you know, I know some people, especially African-centered teachers I've talked to are like, well, look, you're talking about this. Well, why don't you just support African-centered education? Well, the truth is there's only so many, like, that's great. We should do that. But there's only so many students that are gonna be in those spaces. The vast majority of our youth are gonna be in mainstream spaces. That's just the reality. So we have to find ways to get into those spaces as well, which this program we're gonna talk about did. Um, so adding to the scientific literature should in theory help this type of programming um, become more prevalent. So part two, my research and findings. So the program was called is called the Cultural Imperative Program. I'm gonna talk about how the research was performed, how the data was analyzed and talk about my findings. And I should say I was hired as an independent um, consultant to assess the program. And I used that same data in my own academic work. So CIP, here's a picture of, yeah, I think it was year one of the program. You can see uh, Deborah Watkins, who, whose organization sponsored the program in the bottom right in the blue sweatshirt, on the blue shirt, sweater, and then Baba Tony, Anthony Browder, Baba Seku in the back on the, on the left. Um, and so this program was sponsored by what originally was called the uh, California Alliance of African American Educators, and um, Mama Deborah Watkins has since trend, has sun, since sunset that organization and created a Black Education Network, Avon, Avon, and that is the current that was the sponsor of the for, during year two of the program. So her, you know, again forever grateful to her for creating this program and making sure that the funding was there and administering this program so it was possible. And then IKG, of course, was a major part, is a major part of this program. And I'm gonna talk about where it's at now later, but um, IKG Cultural Resource Center, who sponsors Wisdom Wednesdays, of course, and Baba Tony, um, were the people really creating the curriculum as well. Um, and so this program was done, was implemented in three schools in the Bay region of California. Um, I think over the course of two years, there was more or less 80 students that you know, were in there at some point for some period of time. And all Black students, of course, and um, the demographic, if anyone is familiar with the Bay, like, it's a very interesting demographic because um, it's very diverse. And specifically in this school system, at least as of 2014, 47% of the community and in, in the school, the, 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 the students and schools there, 47% uh, were, were Latinx people, 40% were people of Asian descent. 7% were European American or white folks, and 3% were American African. So by far the smallest group are black folk in this region. And even, and as a result of that, even when you look at that, the black population, a, a high percentage are multi-ethnic or multicultural because one parent is like traditional Af American African and another parent is either like from the African diaspora or you know, Mexican or from somewhere, uh, again, a, a parent with the, with Asian descent, et cetera. So you have a lot of people who are mixed as well. I think 25% of um, the students that the black students that were in this program had some kind of mixed ancestry um, as well. It was a very specific population. It's not a traditional space in that way, a traditional demographic. To get into the program, they really opened it up to all black students that wanted to attend, um, but they did specifically try to recruit students with low GPAs so that, you know, again, this was intended to be something that could boost them and to boost their academic achievement as well. Um, but there were definitely students that had high academic performance as well. 
in the program. Um, the purpose of the program, I'll just read you the quote, is to instill in Black students the ability to successfully navigate school and life by introducing them to aspects of history and culture in order to sustain themselves and generations to follow. Um, so that was the purpose. And again, the main presenter being Anthony Browder, self-described memory recovery specialist, historian, um, also a Howard alum. So the structure of this program, Baba Tony or Baba Sekou, I should call him. He has a, a second name now um, after being installed as a chief. Um, uh, went to the, the, the school system once a month um, over the course of the school year. So over the course of the school year, that would be nine times that he would come do a presentation in all three of the schools. Some of uh, uh, one of the schools had a had a program that was for black students that was an actual course every day that they took. That was a whole another very great program, um, but the CIP was implemented within that uh, pro program, Project Word, that um, Deborah Watkins also established in the school system. But for the other schools, they had to pull out students at the time period that he would be there and they would come and, and all be together in that space. Um, so they had to leave their actual like pre-scheduled pro, you know, uh, class to, to do that. Um, there, for year two, there were review sessions that um, Baba Tony's daughter, Atlantis Browder, who's a scholar in her own right, and 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 um, scholar, teacher, author, you know, great individual, <laughs> would come out between the sessions and make sure to solidify the information they were learning. Would do quizzes and kind of review the information with them. Um, so year two, she she started to get involved as well. And then Amir Tyson was is a local was a local activist and. Um, poet, I think, who also had a book, Black Boy Poems, I think it's called. Um, he would also do presentations during year two. They also went on field trips each year, so you can see some of them. And, and for, they went to DC and actually went on the Egypt on the Potomac field trip um, and visited the, the our, our museum, right? The National Museum of African American History and Culture, um, as well as the Museum of um, Natural History. And it's really important that students went to these places because with um, Baba Tony because he would really contextualize it, right? So if you're like us, you know, the first thing you notice when you get to that bottom floor in that museum is that we are starting our history in slavery. The if very minimal treatment is given to pre-slavery history. There's some mention of Timbuktu and other Western African civilizations, but it's very minimal, right? So we are starting our history in slavery in this museum, which is problematic. Right. So he would take students to this museum, but then he would go to the Museum of Natural History. And there's a human origins exhibit where they acknowledge that humankind in this current evolution, Homo sapiens sapiens, begins in Africa. And this is why sophisticated civilization in its earliest forms begins in Central and East Africa. Right. So he would take them to these two spaces to put it into context. Right. The limitations of the, our Black Museum those are major limitations. So it's important to do both. And then there were parent, parent family engagement meetings. Um, and like I said, about 80 students. And I'm going to try to go fast. I can't believe it's already 824. I thought I was going to be like done by now. <laughs> so I think, you know, the program's curriculum can really be categorized as Africana heritage engagement. And this is, again, thinking about African achievements, talking about the enslavement of African people, but making sure we focus on the resilience when we talk about that and not starting our stories there, but also then giving psychological tools to the participants that are gonna help them succeed despite obstacles they're going to encounter um, in their life. Those are the books. These are two of Baba Tony's books that were essentially kind of um, shaped the curriculum. They also had to write monthly reflection papers. So it's like read a chapter, then reflect on how does this, uh, how is this related to your own experience? As a, as, a, as, as a person of African descent and how might you be able to use what you're learning um, to empower yourself. So one thing Baba Tony does really good as all of you know is he's a media critic, right? And when Black Panther came out in 2018, he had a phenomenal presentation just that showed how just all of the African, the authentic African elements in this movie. Um, and so one of the presentations he did both for the parents of participants in the program and the participants was one that a lot of us have probably seen also um, just about Black Panther and breaking that all down and breaking down how it's all 
so much of that storyline came out of Africa and just all the culture, right? And of course, just the the uh, Wakanda Forever salute. I mean, you can see where it comes from, right? Um, royalty in Africa, royalty in Kemen, ancient Kemen, ancient Egypt. Um, so rest in power, Chadwick Boseman. Um, but, you know, so this was one that was very engaging. I had a lot of participants talk about this presentation and how it was like so engaging. And when they went home, they just had these huge family discussions about it. There were some challenges and they adjusted subsequently, the, the program subsequently, um, based on some of the things that I suggested from the research and the assessment, as well as some of just what they observed. Um, just for time's sake, I won't get too much into that, but they're listed here. So my process, um, you know, in, in, in research, there's quantitative and qualitative, right? So qualitative, just ask open-ended questions and quantitative looks at hard data, numbers. And, you know, a lot of people are very much advocates of one or the other in academic spaces, depending on your framework or your, theoret you know, your theoretical framework. But I would argue that like, we need to break away from thinking about we're so beholden to a certain method it's like when you have multiple methods you're going to have a stronger uh research stronger research right um and so really the type of data you collect and use in your analysis really should depend on the questions you're asking not on the framework or your theory or someone else's theory about what frame what type of method you use so i just listed here real quick what's what i use so the qualitative Data analysis with integration and thematic review. I'm really, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but I'm just putting it out there for the psychologists on the call. Uh, Dr. Brielle, uh, <laughs> 16 interviews, 19 observations. So I went to California four times over the course of the two years to observe the program. And I also observed them or came and put, you know, looked at what they were doing when they came on the field trip in DC. So I interviewed students, the facilitators of the program and a couple of parents. And the quantitative data, you can see the analyses I did listed there, again, just for the psychologists in the room, um, and the data that I had. So demographic, academic, took used the survey to assess aspects of racial and cultural identity, and then looked at their participation level in the program. So findings. So we found that the program had a positive impact on certain aspects of racial and cultural identity. So specifically for racial identity, we saw a very strong impact. We looked at like levels of uh, national of, of the racial identity before and after the program. So it was a very strong impact that we saw on uh, one aspect of racial identity, which is the nationalist one, which again is how much a person thinks it's unique and important to be black and feels that it's a special thing, right? So sees it as a positive thing um, that was very much impacted. And then when it comes to cultural identity, um, I used that framework, AAHCO, or Africana Attainment Heritage Cultural Orientation. I used that framework, and we saw that that was very positively impacted. And one aspect of it, awareness of Africana heritage, was also in its own right positively impacted. So this is a good thing. What I did, what I also witnessed, though, that on their own, two other aspects of AAHCO, which is feelings of connectedness to Africana heritage and an inclination for excellence on their own were not sig impacted significantly, meaning that, uh, you know, they could have been impacted, but statistically speaking, we didn't see it as significant. The longer in the program, the greater the impact. And we saw a positive relationship between people with stronger levels of those two, those aspects and GPA, meaning there's a relationship between academic achievement and these, um, and these aspects. We did see that there were aspects of racial identity that had a negative relationship with GPA. And I, will, I guess we don't have time <laughs> right now because I want to get through a lot more, but we can, if we have time, we'll look at that. So how did the impact occur with two themes, space and process? You can see kind of the definitions there. Space. So when you have this maroonage, this counter space, this was a big part of the impact we saw. So the unique atmosphere that we witnessed supported the transformation of processes that participants underwent, and, we're, and that was part of theme two. In a school environment that has few Black students, bringing them together to discuss issues pertinent to their own unique heritage and present condition was something participants valued very much. And it was a, you know somewhat of a cultural and racial safe haven for Black students, a place of their own. And you can read the quote that one of the students, from one of the students, 
process, making connections. So for highly engaged participants, um, engaging in Africana heritage was developmentally beneficial. It precipitated an emergent critical consciousness which is both a process and state of awareness involving three main components, critical analysis, sense of agency, and critical action. So essentially, if you are, this is a goal, this would be everyone's goal to have our youth become critically conscious because you understand history, understand how it's applied to the present, and then understand how to move about with agency and affect change in the future and in the present. So why did this impact occur? Again, for time's sake, I guess I won't get too deep into here, into these things, but just to summarize, participant response to the program was highly emotionally charged and precipitated a development of new emotion schemas. Emotion schemas are really important to how we navigate in the world. Um, it's a complex set of emotions that drive our thought, behavior, and actions. And it's something that during adolescence are shifting all the time, even more than um, any other time. And so it's very important to engage people at that time. But it's something that's not fixed, right? Emotion schemas shift, but there's something that we use and apply to understand the world and move about in the world. But one thing we saw was that students experienced two main emotions. They were angry that they had never been given this history. They were pissed um, that, you know, they had never, the school system hid it from them and their families never taught it to them. Other people never did. So they were upset, but they were also very joyful simultaneously because now they could just sigh of relief you know really their own heritage was 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 now connected to greatness and it gave them a sense of confidence um i guess you know we'll leave those other things for now but there was a lot of reasons why the impact occurred um you don't have to rush you can go ahead and share the impact we have time sure okay <laughs> okay yeah. so okay so So the emotion schemas, the, the psychological tools um, were things that the program offered to, to, to its participants. And I think a, one of them that stood out more than others was just the modeling of the praxis of having an African-centered viewpoint and being critical of the things happening around us from that viewpoint. So when Baba Tony would go into the classroom and talk about things happening in the present and connect them to the past, a lot of students had aha moments. And they had a model to take an example of how you do that, right? So that they can continue to go and do that throughout their life. So one participant said, quote, they give you all the tools you need and they push you to the limit of the best you can do. And then you apply it, right? And I thought that was a very telling quote. Um, so those are the psychological, one of the psychological tools. The structure of the program supported a high level of participant engagement. Um, so for my psychologists in the room, we know that there's something called TSRQ or teacher student relationship quality. And in this case, um, you know, there was a high level of, of that. And um, in, the, in the psychological literature, we look about, think about teachers. Um, one thing that really we, we know that benefits black students in particular is teachers that are characterized as warm demander. So you really care about the well-being of your students. You're warm to them. You probably love, you like show them love, you show concern for things happening outside the classroom, you understand, you, you are aware of things happening outside the classroom. And at the same time, you have a high standard for them. You don't let them slack or you don't let them, um, just because you love them and, and want them to feel good doesn't mean you have to like let them off the hook, right? So that's the demander part of it. And Baba Tony was that, right? So I'll, that's all I'll say about that for now. Um, there was an experiential learning cycle. So like, again, here's the information and then you have it a, a reflection paper. How are you applying this information? Okay, now let's go on a field trip and see this information in real life and how it's impacted the world. So when you see stuff, so if you've ever taken, a lot of people here obviously have taken the Egypt on a Potomac field trip in DC. If you haven't, please do this season. This season. Um, you know, when you see living, breathing history, it's another experience than just reading about it, right? So it's transformative and that was part of the program. And then, you know, parent involvement was huge. And being that they were in a program with their peers and they even went to a conference of, um, you know, black student leaders of California as part of the program. So being around other students that were trying to be positive and, and learn their history and be activists, like had a major impact on them. And that is going to reinforce the impact, right? Because when your family and your peers have the most impact on you as a youth and especially peers, 
So when you have other peers around you engaging in these processes, it's just going to help strengthen your impact as well. Now, when I look, when I interview students, I only interview or participants, I only interview those that were identified as like highly participatory. So I can only really tell you why it was impactful for those students. I can't tell you for students that were not greatly impacted why they weren't necessarily, but we do have theories about that. And I think, you know, when a lot's happen, one of the biggest ones is when a lot's happening in your life outside of school and you can't focus on school, you're not gonna be able to really be involved in a program as well, right? But I do think that there is something to a latent impact, right? So often, you know, we hear something in one year out the other, but it is actually still there. And that it becomes like you hear something else later and here and there, and then you might see a YouTube video and say, oh, now I get what he was talking about. And I'm sure Tony has seen this multiple times where someone says, dang, I, I get it now, right? So I do think even for those students that we didn't see a great impact in the data, I think that there is a latent impact that we can't measure yet. And I would love to like follow up with students years from now or even now, because it's been years to see what type of impact they've experienced since. So these are just quotes from the parents that were highly involved, a couple of the moms. Um, and they kind of talked about how this was so important to them because they didn't get this growing up and they couldn't give it to their children growing up because they didn't have it. Um, and, they and, and students really talked about how when they would go to the, parent, the family engagement meetings and they would you know, drive home together, like there was just great dialogue and discussion happening in that car ride. So car discussions somehow, like several people talked about how that was a big thing for their family. So, you know, students, the participants would go home, share with their family. The program also gave the books to the parents, hoping that the parents would read it and really be able to have a conversation. And some parents did read the books, but I know not all of them did. And some parents weren't very involved. There was actually a, a requirement for parents to be involved in the program. And that is actually what I didn't mention earlier, an essential element of education period, but especially of African-centered education that the whole community needs to be involved and the parents um, throughout the school experience. But back to the model that I introduced earlier, the model that looks at how curricular culture hegemony impacts ultimately academic outcomes via beliefs about blackness and then racial identity and aspects of cultural identity. So through the research, I was able to add to this model, right? And a model is obviously just theoretical, but it's something that you know we can use to assess what's happening and how to impact things. So when you look at the additions at the top, you see these three red boxes. So we see that Africana heritage engagement, and when you look at the, sorry, when you look at the lines between the boxes, the thick lines represent relationships that we can be very confident about because there's a lot of research that supports that. The thinner lines are either theoretical, which means there's very little data to support it, but it's a theoretical relationship, or there's just a small amount of data, right? So those are areas that need to be further tested and understood. Um, and those are represented by the thinner lines. But you can see these three red boxes at the top are about process. So Africana engagement, Africana heritage engagement is going to impact uh, one's critical consciousness development as well as their beliefs about blackness. But you know, we don't have as much information about that specifically. And I think specifically, again, the KPA storyline or the knowledge production and application storyline is what I'm interested in there. Um, but it's not as strong as a relationship based on the research. But when you look at that heritage engagement, when it's done through a maroonage space, in this case, this program, it we, we see now it does, and the literature supports that when you have the space and that content is gonna have a strong impact on one's critical consciousness development. Again, critical consciousness being something essential to being, to understanding what's happening around you in this world. And there's all, those things have a connect, connection to these, to the original model, of course, right? So. When you have a critical consciousness and develop that or even a foundation for it, it's going to have a positive impact on these aspects of racial and cultural identity, on academic outcomes directly as well. Um, and so what I filled in in box 1C is kind of some of the, a lot of the findings from this, this current project um, are filled in there that I talked about earlier. I wish I had, again, more time, and I know this is like, might be convoluted because I'm trying to get through it, but like, this is the model. And I can share this model with anybody interested as well. Again, I'll give you my email address. Um, but this is the model I wanna to continue to work on. Um, interrupting cultural hege hegemony. I can never say that word right, hegemony. <laughs> so I think what I wanna work on further is, you know, further research to support those weaker pathways, 
further testing and refinement of AHCO as a framework. Um, I have some critiques of the racial identity tool that I used, and I want to really establish really establish the knowledge production application documented like scientifically as well, because it's not, it's more theoretical, but I think it's there, you know, but I, I need to document it and, and prove that. And I want to publish something at some point. I was really, <laughs> after finishing, I didn't have the capacity to think about that, but maybe I will at some point. So these are my next steps, hopefully. Also, this is another question. I'm going to not, I'm not going to give you too much time here because I'm going to get to the next points. But one of the questions that remain that I still don't have an answer to is what may be required for the feelings of connectedness to Africana heritage to be impacted. We saw an impact on awareness of Africana heritage, but somehow the onus of feeling connected to that heritage is a higher bar to, 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 to impact. And so it probably requires just a higher level of treatment. Again, this program was limited and had some challenges based on the fact that it was in a mainstream space. So if you have any thoughts, please do trip to Africa. Exactly. <laughs> that might be a, a great one, but that's something to think about. So if you have any thoughts, please just put those in the chat, but I have to, I'm going to get to the next point. So section three, how do we make sense of this, right? Implications for parents, teachers, implications for anyone that's involved in the socialization of our youth, really. So I want to talk about the context, talk about the strategies. So context. I mean, everyone's aware, I'm sure, that there's just a lot happening. We're in a politically charged situation in the last few years, especially as it relates to education. It's a battlefield right now. Um, it's not so much about thinking about the well-being of youth. It's more about political ideology. But some really great trends that are happening is that there is a stronger movement in mainstream spaces to disrupt the American narrative of American exceptionalism, um, America starting in with Jamestown and the pilgrims coming really it starts in 1619 when the first enslaved Africans come that's how America starts. We know that America's wealth is all built on the enslavement system in the first place so you cannot understand this country if you don't start your history or start the American story of American enterprise in 1619 not 1620 right and that's why that project was so important how to be an anti racist as well. These are published, this, these books are published by a mainstream publisher, uh, Penguin Random House, right? So the fact that they're supporting these things that are disrupting the, the American mythology, right? And therefore disrupting ultimately the American power structure um, is significant. Now, don't get me wrong. They don't have benevolent intentions and want to free, get make sure that we're free and understand things. This is market demand, right? Because we're now, because we live in an environment that people are more conscious in the last few years, well, they know they're going to sell books to those to us, right? So that's why it's happening. It's market demand, it's capitalism. But at the same time, it's a good thing, right? So there's different approaches to curriculum and justice-based approaches that are listed there. Again, I, I think I'll keep going, though. And we have a situation where a lot of people are being encouraged to confront, white people are being encouraged to confront their white privilege. And I think any teacher who wants to teach students that are not white needs to do this. And this is a particularly sensitive issue. Um, I have no empathy for white people that feel guilty or, or just or are not are not ready to do this. If you're not ready to do this, don't don't teach black students. Don't teach. Don't teach. You need to do this. Everyone needs to do this, all white people, but in particular, those who are engaged with our youth. And the, you know, the thing is, 80% of our teachers nationwide are white in public schools. In DC, it's more like 50, it's like 50% black. It's not the situation across the country. In Fairfax County, it's more that trend, 80% white and mostly women as well. So we have a very specific demographic teaching our students. And that's that's a problem in and of itself. And another reason why that process of looking and self-reflection is so important. I think one way Dr. Ibram, Ibram X. Kendi talks about, you know, white students and white people, they should look to historical abolitionists as their inspiration. This is not something to be afraid of, right? Look at John Brown. This that's my favorite historical white man, hands down because he sacrificed himself uh, for the cause. He was ready to, to die, he did die, to disrupt the slavery system. He didn't have to do that. In fact, he asked Frederick Douglass to join him. And you know, Frederick Douglass is, of course, a very revered ancestor and was very important, but that wasn't his purpose. You know, He was like, I'm not, I'm not sacrificing my life at this point. I have other things to do. But John Brown was all about it, so I mean, it's a very important figure to teach to white students, John Brown. There's obviously other things happening. The post-pandemic, post-Trump pandemic schooling, homeschooling, 
you know, we mentioned earlier, there's so many more people doing homeschooling, not have the, the numbers, but I'm just going to kind of keep going um, right now. Uh, homeschooling is at an all time high, especially for black families, because we're very aware of the problematic nature of school curriculum and racism in schools. And the mental emotional health of youth right now is at an all time low as well. And it's always been worse for black student for black youth. But right now, across the board, depression and anxiety are all time high for, for, for our youth, and in particular, teenage girls. And I think it's very connected to social media as well. So that's a whole nother conversation, but that's something important to remember that's happening right now. So question, how are these books related? So you can put your answer in the chat, but actually I don't, you know, again, I'm gonna keep moving. These books all are by black authors about, that address oppression of black people. And they've all been highly banned across the country, right? Banned books has always been a thing in this country, but it's an enormous increase in banned books over the last two years um, because there's been such a push against uh, 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 learning about these things by the powers that be and white people that are scared of these things. There have been actually more banned books that are talking about LGD, LG, LGTBQ plus issues, same gender loving people like, there have been more banned books that have to do with those issues, but then there's a, the other number two is really issues that have to do with black oppression. And so that's the commonality with these books. They are disruptors and they've been banned in a lot of different places. Again, a huge increase in banned books across the country. And libraries, schools, and things of that nature. So obviously there's been a very racist backlash to this. Someone mentioned earlier, you know, so we have right rage and fear, Bacon's rebellion, um, was basically happened in the late 1600s. Now, I want to talk about Bacon's Rebellion just because I think it's the underpinning of the white, one of the underpinnings of the white rage and fear that we're seeing that's a reaction. Um, Bacon's Rebellion happened in the late 1600s. It was, without getting into the details, it was an instance of poor white people, indentured white servants, and enslaved black people coming together to overthrow, try to overthrow um, this somewhat, somewhat overthrow the system. But the problem was they were, they were together, right? So the plantocracies understood like, hey, we're going to stop using white indentured servants, and we need to make sure that we create and solidify the difference between black and white people, make sure there's a divide, make sure that, and then the black codes got passed, which basically, you know, further solidified that difference and really created, I think, this notion that even poor white people have in their head that my problems are based on the other, and in large part due to black people. The fact that I'm poor, have to work hard, maybe whatever, <laughs> it's a trick. It's the 1%, whether the plantation uh, class historically or the 1% today, it's a trick. It's capitalism, right? You're going to have a lot of poor people. So even white people. So it's a trick. Black codes helped create and cement um, that belief. The Crest, the Crest theory of color confrontation is also important to understand because she talked about, Dr. Cress Wilson talked about um, the fear ingrained in white people's psyche of annihilation. And part of that is also giving up power with the browning of America, right? Because white people will not be the majority soon, so-called white people. So that is happening in the psyche as well, I think. So we have this reactive racism. So since January, 2021, 44 states have introduced bills or taken other steps that would restrict teaching critical race theory, really just talking about, you can't talk about race and racism, basically. CRT or critical race theory is a smokescreen, right? No one's introducing a graduate level, um, you know, uh, theory into these classrooms, but it's really about you. We don't want you to talk about race and racism. We don't want white people to talk to confront their privilege. They often say things like, we don't want white people to feel guilty. Why are you making our students feel guilty? Right? This is a literally what they say. And I was going to talk about kind of the origins of what's happening right now. I don't think there's time, but I suggest you look at John Oliver last week tonight. There's an episode from last year that he really summarizes what's happening with this very well. And basically, in a nutshell, what's happening is that right wing political operatives are playing upon this psyche that I talked about of a fear of black empowerment from white people. They are 
activating it, activating that narrative for their own political gains. And that's why you see white parents in classrooms talking about CRT is reverse racism and things of that nature. It's, this is a political game and they're pawns. Okay, make, make no mistake about it, they're pawns. And so then there's of course, positive efforts that are fighting against them, like in the Zen Education Project, making sure that we support our teachers who are doing the right thing in the classroom. So one more question, what is this list? You probably have seen this list recently, right? Uh, put it in the chat if, well, for time's sake, I'm gonna keep going, but these are all the authors that recently Florida banned from the AP African-American Studies course that we heard about in the news, right? It's funny because this can work against that whole movement because now we all see these names and probably people are Googling these names and figuring out their works now that they see they've been banned. Same thing with banned books. Once you ban a book, it's like people are more interested in that stuff and there's more efforts towards making it available. But one thing I'll say is that there should be some other authors on this list that ended up that would end up getting banned. Like this is a list of cultural historians and psychologists and scholars that I look to and that have been very essential to the work we're talking about with uh, African-centered body of work and scholarship. Uh, they should be in the curriculum as well, but they're not, so they're not banned, but they're not in there in the first place. <laughs> so that's another problem, of course. So this was a question to consider for time's sake, I'm gonna keep going. But here are our strategies. I'm sorry this took so long. Uh, strategies to support Marunage and development of critical consciousness. So we gotta understand the nature of knowledge itself. I'm gonna skip this video. Um, well, let's show the video real quick, it's quick. So tell me in the chat if you recognize what movie this came from. It's old. There you go, Men in Black, right? This was that little marble that the aliens were playing with that showed that all these galaxies were inside. So it's, yeah, Men in Black. So this was so, I think this was such so great because it just shows like we are all just little specks of dust in the ultimate grand schemes of the grand scheme of the universe, right? We're literally stardust, um, but we are just, you know, such a small part. We have to understand and put our own experience into that scope, right? The earth is billions of years old. Like we live for, you know, 70, 80, 90, 100, whatever. So understanding and putting that to context um, is important. That's the nature of knowledge. Also like this graph depicts the notion that we really only know what we know, right? So that green portion is, this is the, these are the things that we know we know. We know basic physics, there's gravity. That larger slice is we're aware of certain things that we don't really know about. So we're aware of certain quantum physics and dynamics, but we can't explain them. So it's kind of like we know about them, but we don't really know about them. We know we don't know. We're aware that we don't know. The rest of that box is stuff that we're not even aware that we are aware of, right? And that's the, what, 90% of the knowledge in the universe. We don't even know that we don't know about it, right? That we have to put what we know into context. And that's why when you have knowledge, oftentimes new information becomes available and it disrupts everything we thought we knew. So that's important to just contextualize. Anyone who says they know everything and, and, and presents themselves as such, like don't listen to them because you know that, that type of mentality means you are not ready to grow or you're not willing to continue to grow. You are based on your ego. Information discernment. We have to teach our youth. It's the Google information era, right? We have to teach our youth how to discern information. You can Google something, you can look at Wikipedia, but don't stop there. Understand the sources, get to the source material. That type of access with our smartphones is a gift and a curse because we are becoming intellectually lazy and using misinformation, right? We have to teach our youth how to be intentional and, and, and be able to discern the information that they get. The AI that's coming, these tools, the generative AI that we've been hearing about, right? This is, this is huge because AI is based on machine learning. Machine learning depends on the data that's already been generated and that data set across time and space is racist, right? Because it's, it's all of the experience that's been had up to the present moment, which includes so much racism and bias. And so those are the, that's the information that's informing these tools. So we are reinvigorating or, or rejuvenating, reifying that bias, those, those, that same, that's very problematic. And a lot of these algorithms are built by one demographic, white men for the most part. Look up the documentary Coded Bias on Netflix. It really explains it well. 
But generative AI is a huge space that we need to understand and be aware of. Objectivity and subjectivity. If you're gonna approach knowledge and you wanna generate knowledge, you must come with the objective standpoint, right? So that you're not biased in how you, the, 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 the conclusions you come to, but understand that objectivity is limited. No one's completely objective because we are subjective beings. We wouldn't even come into a field of study if we didn't have any emotional reason to do so or emotional impetus. So this current paradigm values objectivity so much. And so according to Dr. Murmurani, that really starts with Plato and how he separated an object and a subject. And that has its place. But when it becomes, when it takes over and we stop thinking about how are we related to this information and understanding that we're subjective beings, that just is, um, is, is imbalanced. But again, you have to come towards the field of study with an objective standpoint to get real truth though. But we have to understand and put that into context. I talked earlier about knowledge production and intellectual genealogy, really seeing the totality of, 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 of knowledge and how it transcends time and space. Nothing new under the sun. We have to kind of understand that and put ourselves, understand that Africa was huge in generating the foundations of knowledge as well, of course. So number two, adopt an intentional perspective and balanced practices. So African-centered history, looking at a long arc perspective, again, connecting ourselves to our ancient history, not just like West, West and, and Central Africa, that's essential too, but then looking beyond and looking to the very deep beginnings. Um, you have to understand African history relative to Eurasian history and, and African-American history relative to itself in that way. There is a great timeline. If you go to ikgculturalresourcecenter.com, there's a timeline that is huge that puts this into context and makes it very visually clear. Kemet is here, 3200 BCE. 3,000 years later, the Greeks emerge and Kemet is declining, but there's 3,000 years of a civilization there prior to these civilizations that this country claims are like the, you know, the epitome of knowledge or the epitome of excellence. And they took everything out of Africa in the first place. The Greeks didn't lie about that, but our his the historians of our time lie about that, right? So if you look at what the Greeks said, this is what IKG talks about more than anything. If you look at what the Greeks said, we know they acknowledge that. They went to Africa to learn. All the universities were in Africa, right? So we have to be very clear about that. When you look at the short, short arc or the more recent history of enslavement, you know, if, I don't know if Baba Kojo is here, but he has been doing a lecture series that he talks about the resilience and resistance in our history. So if we're gonna talk about that history, we need to be very clear about how much resilience and came out of that and the resistance to the oppression and focus on that. Be grounded in indigenous and Afri African cultural values. Been talking about this. So ma'at is a concept that, that in ancient Kemet that translates into reciprocity, harmony, balance, righteousness. There's not an English word or Western language doesn't have a word to describe the totality of this concept. This is a concept though, when we talk about cultural continuity, both Dr. Mario Beatty and his teacher, Theophila Benga, a Congolese scholar who's a language, both of which are language experts, but they have really broken down this word and shown how the same concept exists in many traditional African societies. And really it's much even more bigger than the term of karma. It, 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 it's a map, it's a, it's, a, it's a way to guide our thoughts and actions to be more aligned with ma'at. And I can't really say too much more now, but like, it's really important. Look up ma'at if you're not familiar. Understand your default cultural lens. Like, are you really seeing things from your own perspective, right? If you see someone walking down the street, if you're, if you're a person of African descent, when you refer to someone, do you say, oh, that black guy over there, et cetera, et cetera. Why do you have, if you are black, why would you say that black guy? Why don't you just say that guy? That is your default. That's your perspective, right? Dr. Um, Andreas Woods or Baba Kwao kind of talked about this a lot where, you know, we tend to take the perspective of our, of our oppressor instead of just being in, grounded in our own perspective. And it, it, it's just multiple levels to that. And that's something to assess and, and address all the time. Developmental considerations, I think, you know, it's really important. I think the one point I'll say here is it's really important to start our history with our students with ancient Africa and with Africa and not start with slavery because that makes a big impact on their development, how they see things. And I can say more, so much more about that, but I'll leave it at that for now. I wish we had a whole nother <laughs> hour. It's important to model how you want your students or your, your youth to be. So if you're in the house reading books, you need to read books. You need to have books. Research shows that if you just have books in the house, that's gonna make 
for better readers. But one thing I've noticed too, is that oftentimes we're on digital media now reading, right? On our phone or computer. If our kids see that, they don't know that we're reading and learning and growing. They just think you're on the phone. So it's important if you're, if you're doing digital reading to show them I'm reading. I'm not on social media or chatting or messaging, like I'm reading, okay? So it's important to model and understand their perspective um, and not assume that they see what's happening because it's not always clear. Words matter. Don't say slaves, say enslaved people, right? Simple, enslaved people is the state of being, it's not who we were. And say, if you're of African descent, don't displace yourself from the history. We are our ancestors, right? From, from a spiritual perspective. We are our ancestors, we, we return. Why do we displace, even black teachers sometimes will refer to black history as if they're not connected to it or a part of it, right? So be very aware of the terms you use, personalize this history, be anchored and rooted in it. I think we have to also give our youth this information and grounding, but then let them be authentic in how they express themselves with it. Um, and not force them to see, and I'm talking to myself here too, um, they have to they own it themselves. And, and they are, you know, every generation is different. And we look at some of the things they do, like they're crazy, like the TikTok videos, but hey, hey that's part of it. If they want to learn history and they make a TikTok video that talks about the history, hey, that's, <laughs> if that's what happens, cool. But at least you're taking it and making it your own. And identify and address the narratives affecting your child's potential. So they might be intersecting narratives there, right? It's not just the knowledge production application one, but it might be you have several things that your child um, narratives connected to who your child is. Their, their narratives related to having darker light skin, et cetera. Like identify what those are so that you can address each one. And again, I don't have all the answers here. Here are just some of my thoughts, right? But um, I think we all, I just want to give the principles and like how you apply them. It would be great to have a discussion about how to do that. These images here, I guess I don't have time to get into them, but I don't have time. I'm gonna keep going. I know I need to finish. Um, thank you for bearing with me if I have these last few minutes because it's nine o'clock and I think we're supposed to end at nine. So nourish nat natural engagement. Take opportunities when they're presented, right? So when our children see things in, 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 in the news. Um, take those opportunities when they bring them up, right? There was, in a different context, I heard someone say something like this. Don't have one 30-minute conversation, have 31-minute conversations. When things happen and they ask questions, talk about them when it happens. Like, you don't have to always be in control of when you have that conversation. Just be ready, right? When Barbados became actually free, finally, like a, like a year or two ago, that was a great opportunity because it was like, wait, they weren't truly independent yet? Why? And then you can get into a whole history and you have to learn that history, but that's an opportunity. Be authentic, encourage authenticity. So going back to that quote about, you know, being black or brown in America is always a constant negotiation. You have to find your own level of maroonage. And, and I would say seek to always be further and further into that maroonage, but you got to start somewhere, right? Seek and assess the right literature. And actually, I'm going to put in the chat when we're done a few resources. There's a plenty more, but there's a few African centered teachers I want to um, put, put out there that do really great work and are a great resource. And then you can draw from popular media. Now, Tony, again, Baba Tony is so good at this right, at taking media that comes out and breaking it down for us and showing the meaning and what it should mean for us and what examples we can take from it. In the last few years, we've definitely seen more media that addresses Black history. Now, before anyone says it, there are definitely, these aren't perfect, these movies, but they are entry points into having meaningful discussions. And when you watch a movie, you can criticize the parts that are not correct or limited, right? I have problems with all these movies, but I also loved watching all of these movies. And make no mistake, Avatar is a movie about Black Indigenous people being colonized, but any people being colonized, really, right? That is, that is our story. So, but these, these are just some that I've looked at in the last few years that I think have been really a part of this, this new kind of era of somewhat consciousness. Again, they're making these movies because there's a market demand for this type of information, though. So again, we have to be critical of these movies, too but there's opportunity in looking at them together with our children. And last, instill group solidarity and engage community. 
it's so important to define the words that we use for our youth and for ourselves. And I think these are three that are extremely important, power, success, and self. Power is not subjugation of other people. It's not control of other people. That is aggression. And aggression comes from a place of insecurity. Power I define as the capacity or ability to control your own destiny. And included in that definition is the ability to influence positively your own community and people, right? You cannot be powerful on your own. The nature of life is not individual. That is an Anglo-Saxon notion that shows up everywhere, even in those people, even in us who say that we're conscious because we've been so trained to be that way. If we want to be powerful, we have to see ourselves, our self, as not just being our individual self, but as part of a larger whole, our community. And anyone who gets success, first of all, nobody's successful on their own. They had to have a network, they had to draw from other people that taught them and gave them opportunities. And to teach the masses that this, rug, this notion of rugged individualism, like there's this romanticized American success story, I did it all on my own, is never true. No one ever did it all on their own, ever. And white men who are rich, they know that, and they have their networks, and they draw upon their, the, the, the foundations their family members gave them. They did not do it on their own, right? So to teach the masses that rugged individualism is something to, to aspire to is a trick. So we need to define these words and make sure that we understand and have a common definition. So political, social, economic power, it's important to build those things as black people. But I would say that like, if we're doing it and we're just becoming a part of the system that we're not actually changing things, right? If we're getting degrees and be accumulating power just to continue to serve the matrix, to serve the system, that is the system, the capitalist system that is destroying the earth, then we are not being stewards of African centered, an African centered value system. We have to change things as well, right? We have to break down these systems and create new systems if we're going to be sincere African centered people. Um, so let's build power, but let's change the paradigm as we build power. Again, Dr. Martin Luther King said it best when he said, We're trying to integrate into a burning building. And like once he said that, he was soon after assassinated. Once he started seeing the, the systematic nature of oppression, military, uh, uh, poverty, et cetera, that's when he became really, really dangerous. And I think the same of when Malcolm started to see intersections and Fred Hampton was all about intersections and, and disrupting capitalism, they were all assassinated by the government. That's when they became the most dangerous, when they saw the systematic nature of how things are happening. So lastly, what can allies and comrades do, right? So it's important because all the progress that we have made or, or things, progress we have made, uh, you know, has been also, you know, white, there have been white allies. John Brown, perfect example. There have been white allies. Um, so what can allies do today? Well, they need to, white people need to address from an anti-racist lens, their privilege and positionality and constantly say, what can I do to mitigate that and empower other people if you are truly trying to help and become ab an abolitionist or in, in that spirit, right? Um, that's so important, it starts with studying, but you have to get over what they call white fragility. You have to get over that guilt and say like, how can I actually do something to change things then? Otherwise, you're not helping. And then other, oppressed people that are not white. Like, I think it's important to build solidarity in movements with them, understand that there are different struggles, but there are commonalities in that struggle that we can pull from to create power and, 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 and push back against common, the common enemy of, of oppression. And I would say one more thing for white people that want to do something that's significant, you can buy and strive to buy from black owned businesses. I mean, it's still supporting capitalism, but that's the reality we're in. You can do that. That's something you can literally do now. Buy Black. Another thing you should and can do as a white person is support reparations. We are in a space that is unprecedented with the conversations happening on, on, on a national and local levels about reparations. And for the first time, there's one uh, uh, locality, uh, uh, Evanston, Illinois, actually passed a bill where they're taking money from the cannabis industry that is oppressed, also oppressed Black people 
and putting it into reparations. Now it's limited, but it is a start. And this conversation is happening in California and Boston and other places. This is unprecedented. Um, one of our awesome local activists in Kichi Taifa has been in the reparations movement forever. And she talks, she, she recently released a book and she's gonna talk at Sankofa, I think on Friday, next Friday, next Friday, I think, come out, I guess. But I'm gonna be there because she is amazing. And she talks about how what's happening now throughout her, all these decades she's been involved in this movement is unprecedented what's happening with reparations. So if you're a white person, help support reparations. Understand that it's not taken away from your power, but it's historically necessary um, because there's no other way to right. It doesn't right the wrongs, but there's no other way to even get close to that. And let's see, last thing, engage schools and teachers. So I mentioned, you know, I'm, I'm an activist in my local school system and, you know, Whenever my kids have had teachers that um, do the right thing, I encourage them. I will get their, I will have the back. Like there's a fear that teachers have of becoming a spectacle on Fox News. Literally, I was told this by the school system administrators, and they don't want to be teach anti-racism and talk about these things because they don't want to get that attention. There's some some people are scared. So we need to encourage the teachers that want to do the right thing to do the right thing. And when they do the wrong thing and just regurgitate the American mythology story, we need to call them out. And to have a conversation, right? So I do this with teachers. Hey, you know, they need to learn too, right? But the ones that are already doing that, let's support them and tell them we have their back, right? And that's something we, we try to do on a local level. Um, and I would say too, if you do that, make sure your kids know that you're doing that, right? That's part of that critical consciousness. I can make a difference. And again, you know, ultimately, we want to put our kids in spaces where they're becoming independent and sovereign, African-centered spaces, but the vast majority are not there. So we need to, what happens in these classrooms is vital to our success in, in the larger movement. That is what it is, right? So we need to do both. Um, it's not going to fix everything, but it's, it's something that can be significant. So last, I had another consideration to, to look at, but I guess <laughs> I'll stop. I'm sorry, I just went over. Um, but this is another one to consider. Last, actually, <laughs> just want to talk about the current program, the uh, CIP program since 2018, since I stopped researching. They've moved out of the, the area where they had the first two years, and now it's a program that's across the country, administered by um, Atlantis Browder, who I'm imagining doing a great job. And um, in, as this says, impacted more than 450 students and families so far. There's both virtual and in-person implementation. I think you're able, if you want to help establish um, a program in your, you know, they'll help you establish a program if you're interested. The next season begins in January 2024. Um, so if you're interested, contact Atlantis Browder, and these are her books. Um, the most recent one, Reflections of My First Trip to Africa, um, on the top. But if you're interested in becoming involved, if you want your children to be involved in that program or establishing a, a CIP site, contact Atlantis um, for more information. Her email address is there. 914, still have 77 people that stayed with us. I think we were at 109 at the beginning. <laughs> so thank you for sticking with us. Um, and that's it. I don't know if we have time for questions and question and answer at this point, but we can. I'm here as long as I need to be. Okay, well, first, um, thank you, Asante Sana, to you for this robust presentation. We're, we at the IKG family, we're so happy and proud of you for this wonderful work um, and your out of Van Cinema cultural, Banneker City Cultural Circle family. We are happy um, and we are in the house and representing. Um, so yes, yeah, so what we're gonna do, you, um, there were a few questions, but you actually covered um, some of the, of the concepts um, within your overall presentation and a few technical questions around your uh, research, which um, we can share with you and you can reach out directly to that person to answer that question. Um, so for everyone who did stay with us, thank you for, um, for still being here. And uh, we encourage you to let Dr. Zukiri know um, your thoughts about his presentation. So we see the chat box starting to get lit up, different reactions. Thank you. We want to, um, again, remind you to go to the IKG Cultural Resource Center.com to learn more about some of our upcoming programs, including the 2023 Egypt on the Potomac field trip season, the upcoming 
webinars being um, hosted and facilitated by our own Tony Browder, as well as information for the December trip to Egypt. We also um, invite you to go there to learn more about upcoming Wisdom Wednesdays. Our next Wisdom Wednesday will be April 19th, and it will feature Dr. Jeff Menzies, a, um, a psychologist, who will be speaking on Dr. Francis Cress Welsing, the works of Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Um, this video will be available in a few days on the IKG Resource Center YouTube page. So you can go to YouTube to see this um, presentation again and to take in all of this great information. So we would like to thank you and we will formally uh, close out. So thanks. Thank you cool. for coming, and we will see you next month. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Peace. Peace.